Hello everyone, welcome back to another exciting and inspiring episode of On Location with Zara Durrani. Wow, you can hear the excitement in my voice, I'm like really loud. She just had her green smoothie, she second did. green she smoothie did. of the day. Um, I am so excited to get this amazing individual artist, actor, filmmaker, writer. He has been in so many of your favorite shows. <laughs> Uh, when you Google him, when you look him up, you see like just the list of IMDb credits is endless. He's worked with some of the top Hollywood Canadian actors. And there is not a show I feel filmed here in Vancouver that he has not been in. You know, it's like you turn on Netflix and it's like, oh, yes, let me look at this show. It looks kind of, oh, there's Viv. <laughs> I'm talking about none other than Viv Leacock, who we were finally able to get on our show. Viv, thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a long time, and we were just trying to figure out how we met. And uh, I think I was your, I think I was your reader for an audition. That's how I think I met you. And perhaps from there. Before that, it was at like a film festival or something. Yeah, that yeah. that for sure. Yeah. But I was like trying to like trace it all the way back. Hmm. I think it was. I think it was that. Probably, you're probably right. And mm -hmm. you know, you. I was saying this earlier. You've always supported me, in whatever I've done. Like if whether I'm putting an event together, a fashion show mm -hmm. thing, something for the holidays, and we've stayed in touch over the years. Even when I was living in Paris yeah. and. Just so great to witness your journey, but I always felt I got your support. Like you were always like, "Yeah, go, girl, yeah. go for it. Yeah. I'm proud of you." Yeah. Like you know, just always getting the acknowledgement, and it's just so nice to hear that. And I feel like yeah. I feel like that about you and your career. I was watching <laughs> Louder Milk, like this show that is here. Everyone's talking about Louder Milk. Yep. You know, it's yep. like um, like a lot of my friends are talking about this and. And seeing, I'm, I'm sitting there casually, just you know. I'm like, who's that? Ah, that's me. <laughs> Tell us about working on that show. Yeah, um, Louder Milk. First of all, it's a very strange name. Um, so Louder Milk is the name, the last name of the protagonist. His mm -hmm. name is Sam Louder Milk, uh, played by Ron Livingston, um, the incomparable Ron Livingston. Such a great dude. Um, so Peter. Peter Farrelly, so from the Farrelly Brothers, something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber. Uh, iconic. Movie. Iconic. He's, he's one of the guys behind, so Bobby Mort and Peter Farrelly uh, put this together. And Bobby Farrelly's there as well. No pressure at all. No, 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 pre <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> but like, you know, in an ensemble cast, yeah, they're, it actually does take the pressure off, or, off a bit. Like, mm. there's, a, there's a bunch of us. Um, but... Working on that show with my man Will Sasso um, from Mad TV, from a bunch of other, a bunch of other projects, uh, I, he is probably one of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. And and I did stand up for a couple of years and and been around Eddie Murphy and a bunch of other people. And Will Sasso, legitimately, all we're trying to do, all of us, is just to not laugh at what he's doing because he's he's brilliant. He's mm. incredible on that show. And uh, working with the Fairley Brothers and Bobby Mort, um, it's just such a collaborative situation. They're, 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 they're all so supportive if you have comedic ideas, if you, you know, if there's something that's going to make this a little more real. Because the show deals with, you know, a touchy subject. It, it follows um, uh, an, an AA uh, counselor played by Ron Livingston, Loudermilk, and his kind of band of misfits that he helps get over their addictions while he is trying to get, you know, stay sober. And they just let us all throw our two cents into character development and 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 did you go to any meetings to like research or like no, you guys I, are No, we you know the well, some of us had experiences with people you mm -hmm. know in our lives that had mm -hmm. gone through um, addiction mm -hmm. and so you know some of us use that and and ultimately uh, there's actually a uh, there was actually an actor on the show who he had his own struggles 
with um, addiction and and ended up um, actually relapsing what, at the end of mm -hmm. season one and like we 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 address it on the show mm. and and it's it's a it's a it's a you know it's a great story he he went and did rehab and he's he's all better now and mm -hmm. and and when we go again cuz we're going to go again uh he's going to be back on so mm -hmm. um we 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 take it seriously as much as we're having like a huge laugh um and there was you know we we make sure that everything is on point when it comes to that mm -hmm. so i'm sober and uh, you know, so a bunch of my friends were talking about, and they, they we were like in like a group chat, and mm -hmm. I go to meetings as well, mm -hmm. and they're like, they're taking pictures, and it, but that's it. it it's yeah. funny, like yeah. you, people can share their most dark things, yep. and you, you all laugh together. Yeah. You know, it's not like it's because now you're in the solution. You're not. You and we know, understand you're, each other. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm just so, because originally I watched, started watching the show on Prime. Yes. And then now it's on Netflix. Netflix yeah. And it's like, boop, you turn yeah, on Netflix. And it's like, I'm like, yeah, look at you go, babe. Top you 10. Know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. was filmed in Vancouver. Yeah. So with everyone, I like to backtrack. It's a little bit of inside the actress studio vibes. <laughs> Uh, James Lipton. I'm channeling my inner James Lipton. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Um, I like to hear how did you get your start? Did you always know you were going to oh. pursue this career? Um, so my, my older brother, Richard uh, Leacock, he's, a, he's an actor as well. And uh, Rich was always uh, an entertainer. So when we were, when we were really young, he, was a, he taught people break dancing. He could dance exactly like Michael Jackson, like exactly like Michael Jackson. <laughs> and uh, um, so like, everywhere we went, there was always some sort of reaction to us. Um, I knew I wanted to be an entertainer by the time I was eight years old. But, mm. but stand-up comedy, that was my, that's my first love. And in particular, Eddie Murphy was like, I idolized Eddie. I put on another level. So just like he idolized Richard Pryor and would like walk and talk and and joke like Richard Pryor, I did that with him. I like, it's, interestingly enough, I don't swear in real life, so it always made imitating Eddie Murphy a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like the clean version of Eddie. And uh, so I knew I wanted to be a stand-up comedian or some sort of entertainer. And I also was a singer when I was a kid, so. Wow. Yeah, so. It was. It was some. It sort was of in your blood. It was, it was in, in my your blood. genes. Like you were meant to be a performer. Definitely, because like as much as it's not something that my dad ended up pursuing in mm -hmm. his life, he could have been, um, like a Sidney Poitier. He could have been. He could have been like a Lou Gossett Jr. He had all that charisma. <sighs> my dad. My dad. He was. Uh, he was. He was one of a kind. But uh, he didn't. He did what he had to do. Work and support the family. But that left my brother and I able to go pursue our dreams. And um, it was really my brother who was pushing me to become an actor. Mm. Uh, I, I just was all about comedy. I, I, I found one, it was, a New Year, it was a New Year's Eve party when I was eight years old. My family, we were over at our, my aunt's place and we, we all start telling jokes. And my brother and I would always do this thing where we would, we would, we would, recount instances where our mother <laughs> it was chasing us because we did something stupid. And so we were telling funny stories about like basically getting our parents upset. And eventually, it started out with my brother and I, and eventually it was just me telling stories. And I was looking out at the crowd and my dad sitting watching me. And my dad was like the ultimate storyteller. If there was a party, my dad was talking, telling jokes, telling stories, making people laugh, mm. just like crying, they can't control themselves. So I was copying my dad, making the whole party laugh, and I connected with my dad, and I saw him see me, mm. and it just did something to me. Like, I, I love this feeling. And um, so yeah, that's why I wanted to pursue being a stand-up comedian. But acting kind of came to find me first, and and uh, Eddie Murphy, and, yeah, not and, just and, acting, but Eddie yeah, Murphy. Yeah. 
like man when when you talk about eddie murphy it takes me back to like being a kid in pakistan and watching beverly hills cops you know like one two three yep. four five yeah, yeah, yeah. and he would talk really fast i was so young watching those like i could barely keep up <laughs> oh, with yeah, what yeah. half of what he was saying eddie and now and now that i would watch you know any of those movies as an adult i was like oh that's what he was oh, that's saying. What he said. that just really went oh, over yeah, my yeah. head <laughs> yeah eddie talks real fast um that is one of the greatest moments of my life as as a tell me about I Spy. Tell me about yeah. you know booking that part. So and what was the journey and process like? Because that that's something you can never forget. No, no, that is like burnt into my mind. So at the time, this is two thousand one. I I I didn't have a resume like I have now. I was nowhere near. There's kind of a hierarchy that happens when in in, in town. If there's an audition that. A breakdown that comes out, casting directors send out breakdowns, and you see like supporting, or you see lead characters that they're looking for, and then supporting, and then smaller roles, and the roles get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so this is a major motion picture starring Eddie Murphy and Owen Wilson. And the character that I'm going out for is the supporting lead character. So he is Eddie Murphy's assistant in the movie. And I... <laughs> I see the breakdown that my agent sends me, and I'm like, come on, there's no way in this world. I'm like, there's 50 guys that have to die before they're gonna look at my tape. Because there's the Dave Chappelle's of the world, there's like the Anthony Andersons. This, this is, you know, this is years ago before those cats blew up. Mm -hmm. So there's all these guys in front of me. There's no way they're gonna look at my audition tape. But I said these words I said, if they judge this fairly, Meaning they're not looking into, oh, he's the hot new stand-up comedian or he just did a show. If they just look at pure comedic talent, mm. I said, I'll get the part. If they do that. If they do that. So what I didn't know was that Eddie had put out like a, a mandate saying he wanted to see a new face for, this, for two particular roles. Mm. He, just, he just happened to say that. Because it was supposed to be a series of movies. The universe was lining up. The movie, the universe is lining up. So, so he wanted to see. He's like, let's just see some new faces. Okay, so now they're open to seeing new faces, and then and then um, so that was one thing that how the stars were aligning. Two, the the director Betty Thomas was also the producer, one of the producers. So now you don't have to have a director fighting with a producer, if you, if they like you. So that's two. And three actually has to do with Betty again. <laughs> Betty said these words. There are no funny black people in Canada. Those were her words. Now, now, that's the way she was coming in to sit down in the auditions. That's her thought process. Because from her experience, she hadn't seen anybody that was funny that came out of Canada that was black. She just, and, she, and that was just her opinion. But that's what, we, that's what you deal with. You deal with that as an actor a lot of times. People come in, in this town and they think, I'm and never going to find that. Did you find that out later? Or you I found that, that out later. Okay. I found that okay. out later. So, <laughs> I'm not supposed to know that, but I do. Um, so, um, so, I, so she had that kind of thing where she's like, I'm not going to be impressed. She had that in her head. Okay, so... So the, the, the part was, his name, his character's name was TJ, and TJ is Eddie Murphy's uh, assistant in the movie. And so he, Eddie plays uh, a cat named Kelly Robinson, and Kelly Robinson is the middleweight boxing champion of the world. So everybody that came in for the part came in dressed up as a professional assistant. But what I knew that meant was if you look at an MMA fight or a boxing match and you see all them brothers hanging out in the ring after, those are the cats that that dude hired. Mm -hmm. But they look like they're rappers. They yeah. all dressed in like they yeah. look they, like they're yeah. from the streets because they're from the streets with the guy who's now the champion. So I was like, so I, <laughs> I went in dressed like a, like a rapper. I had baggy leather green pants on, a skull cap, sunglasses, I go big chain. Everybody's, when I walked in, all the dudes were like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> what, are you, what are you here for? I'm like, same thing as you. And they're like, okay. Okay, everyone's kind of, I see them all kind of looking at me like I'm crazy. Oh, and this is the other thing. 
on the notes for my audition, it said, read with casting director mm. only. So I was going in relaxed because I didn't know the director was in there. So I was totally chill in the waiting room and everybody else was really tense and they were going in one by one and they were screwing up. They were screwing up. They just didn't have the, got to have that pace, right, for, for comedy. So, so Sue Browse is the name of the casting director. She used to be a casting director. I know Sue. Yes. Love Sue. And Lynn Caro. Sue and Lynn were, our ca- were the casting directors for I Spot. And Sue had kind of recognized that I had an ability with comedy so uh, she was pushing for me and my brother uh, for these two roles and so she had she had she had told Betty there are funny black people in this town okay so everybody that went in before me Betty wasn't happy with so for the first time when I actually realized that Betty was in the room is when Sue came out to get me and she was looking very nervous. And Sue, and then all of a sudden I hear this voice say, Sue, get back in here. Sorry, Betty, but Betty's a big woman. She's very tall, very. <laughs> and uh, that's the voice I hear. And this is the first time I'm like, what? There's someone in there with her? So I was like, oh, shoot. But no time to get nervous. And because you've auditioned with Sue before. You're comfortable. Times. You're just like we're walking cool. the park. We're just going yeah. in and do the we're, job. I'm just going to hang out with yeah. Cassidy. It's yeah. all good. So... So now this, and I'm now I put it together why everyone's been leaving with like their tail between their legs. I'm like, what's wrong with these guys? Anyways, so Sue comes back out. She goes in. She goes back into the room. She closes the door for like five minutes, and I, I'm like, what's going on? She comes back out. And she looks at me and she's like, are you ready? And I was like, yeah. Are you ready? And she looked. <laughs> she looked like she looked pale. Okay. So so jump to the fact that I got the part my, and my brother actually got the part as mm. well but um, he was working on a TV show called Doc with Billy Ray Cyrus Miley Cyrus is yeah. dead yes and and actually due to our filming schedule being screwed up because of 9-11 uh, everything got shifted around and so my brother couldn't do the movie because it just wrecked the rest of the schedule anyways so the only reason I know this next thing is because Sue told me this, and thank you, Sue. Uh, so after I filmed the movie and had the whole experience, I was actually hanging out with Sue, and Sue was like, I still, I was thanking her for pushing for me for the movie and pushing for my brother for the movie, and she's like, you're the reason that we even finished working on that movie. And I was like, what? And she said, when Betty called her back into the room, she said, you told me there are funny black people in this town. If the next actor isn't funny, you're fired. Oh, wow. Now, I didn't know that, but, but that's what Betty Thomas said to her. Wow. So that's what I was working against. Yeah. Because I chose correctly in knowing that the look was what I was doing, like yeah. what I was doing was the look they were looking for, when I walked in the door and she saw my, my leather pants, I remember she was like, oh, nice pants. And I, in a normal situation, if it wasn't an Eddie Murphy movie and I wasn't so kind of out of my head with like nerves or whatever, I would have known that that's it. I got this. I would have known right then. But of course, I still am going, there's like thousands of guys that are going to get this part from Los Angeles, from New York. There's tons of guys that are going to do this. I just... Discarded, I just disregarded, disregarded her statement. Normally, in a, in a normal audition, I would have known right there, I got this. Mm. Because you like my look. Mm. And as much as it's about the acting, it's about the look. The, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the powers that be, they don't really have the imagination sometimes to imagine this person they're seeing in the wardrobe that's going to be necessary for them to pull off the part. Mm. And so... When you come in, that's why wardrobe is important. When you come in looking the part, they see it. Hmm. That's the guy. That's the girl. There they are. Do you think it also helped because you had admired and idolized Eddie Murphy? Oh, yeah. And, like, been familiar with his work and... Yeah. 
Yeah, this wouldn't have... This was meant to happen. Like, it you was. were meant to book that part and go on to have, like, even more success. Yeah. But, you know, it's like... So tell me about working with him on set. I know we have to talk about other projects, but I'm so curious <laughs> yeah. because I grew up watching Eddie Bo yeah. Murphy. Yeah. No, honestly, uh, I like I said, I, I, I had the thought in my head that if they judged it, if they judged it fairly, those are my words, then I would get it mm. because I honestly felt like nobody, nobody knows this guy like I do. Mm. Nobody knows. So I went in there doing my best Eddie Murphy. That's what I did for my audition. I was doing my best, like, the timing, the ad libs, all of it, all of it. I was doing it all, and uh, uh, yeah, I won, I won, I won Betty over. And she, when I left the room, this is also, this is also I'm not supposed to know this. When I left the room, she she went crazy, and she was like, "I can't believe we found him here. I can't believe, I can't believe it. Oh my God, I can't believe." And she was like, she called Eddie Eduardo. Eduardo's gonna love him. Oh my God. So, <laughs> so. And the, 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 thing, the, thing that made, the thing that made me very confident watching, walking onto that set was that Betty told me mm. once, we, once I got the part, my brother and I both got the part. We auditioned together and they gave us the part. Once we got it, she told me, Eddie approved this video. He watched your audition and mm. he's like, those are the guys. Mm. So I knew he liked, he liked us. And thought we were funny, and unfortunately, my brother couldn't end up doing the movie, so so I went on I went on to do the movie once it all got rescheduled. And the first thing Eddie said to me on the first day of filming was, "You're real funny, man. You're real funny." To get that from Eddie <laughs> Murphy, you're like, well, just one second, single tear. Me... <laughs> like yeah. I don't think did we have blackberries back then. You're like, I need. Oh to yeah, we had blackberries. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had nothing to record. I need to like. Rec- could you just say that one, yeah, more time? They have... one more time? Yeah, because they Eddie Murphy said I'm fine. Like, I could literally be in court <laughs> for having murdered every pe- uh, like a bunch of people. I'd be like, no, 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 you don't understand. I didn't do it. Eddie Murphy told me I was funny, so <laughs> there's no way this is not funny, right? No, you're going to jail. Yeah. No, honestly, honestly, you cannot, nobody can take that away from me. Mm. Nobody can take that away from me, which makes it difficult when I'm doing comedic auditions because I'm like, I know best. <laughs> I'm like, that's not funny. I'm funny. No, anyways. Um... <laughs> Uh, it, we had a great time. He he was so generous with me. I, I I have this image in my head of Eddie Murphy sitting on an apple box between two cameras, like scrunched down between the two giant cameras, doing off camera lines for me. When the and the director was like, "You you don't need to do that. We had you're standing, Roger. He can do it." And he was like, "No no no, I'll do it. I'll do it." And he never does it for anybody. Wow. This is what, you know, he, for big stars, yes. But like some cat who just booked a part from nobody knows. Mm. But he, we, he, he liked me. He thought I was funny. And Eddie's kind of got an eye for funny people. Mm. You know, Chris Rock being one of them. Mm. He's the guy who discovered, you know, basically discovered Chris Rock. He like, he puts people on. Dave Chappelle. He put Dave Chappelle on in The Nutty Professor. Dave Chappelle is in that movie. And that's what helped. You know, mm-hmm. c- propel Dave Chappelle. Eddie is that guy. So mm. when he gives you a nod, man, it's it. it for there, there's a whole generation of comedians where that was the guy who told you you were funny. You're funny. There's, yeah. there's no there's no two ways about it. There's no two ways about it. So that gave me a massive amount of confidence, and working with him gave me a massive amount of confidence uh, in that. The greatest thing I think I've ever done on set is make Eddie Murphy, I broke him. I made him laugh. I made him laugh. I made him fall out of a scene. And it's like. What would a set be like working with him? Like, did you get, you know, what was it like even working? I hear sometimes people say, I don't even know how we got any work done because we were just laughing too much and having way too much fun. He's very quiet. Mm. Very quiet. Wow, really? Yeah, he's an observer. He likes to watch people do stuff. This is why he's so good at mimicking people because he watches people very, very intently. But he's very quiet. He's, mm. he's the guy who kind of likes to be like a fly on the wall and just observe people. So people think you're going to meet this guy who's like, yeah. no, he's not like that. No way. No. Wow. It's so, it's so, it was a trip. I was because I was like, hey, Eddie, what is that? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, okay, kid, he's relaxed. And I was like, yeah, but, <laughs> and, and you're he, Eddie Murphy. Yeah, I'm like, you're Eddie Murphy. Yeah. You must be so excited all the time. And he was like, yeah, he's just chill. He's very chill. Oh, wow. But he taught he me. He conserves that energy to get yes, on camera. Yes. And yeah. he taught me that. He taught me that. He's like, first day, I was like, <laughs> action. Cut. Talking to everybody. I'm so excited. 
And he's like, yo, man, you're going to want to like, you're going to want to hang on to some of your energy because it's going to be a long day. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm 26 years old. I'm good. Oh, that first day, 15 hours, I was like, oh my God. But I was so excited. It didn't matter. But he was teaching me a very mm. valuable lesson. You have to like conserve your energy. That must have been like the biggest like acting conservatory, like this experience. You're getting all this pulp juice. Yeah. Squeeze. Eddie Murphy, yeah. like what a yeah. legend. And yeah. that was like the de defining moment in your career. Yeah, that's a, it's, you know what's interesting? The most interesting thing about that moment and that situation is that I thought that all right, I'm off to the races, man. Mm. I'm going to Hollywood, and it's oh, we're gone, we're gone, we're good. And it didn't work out like that. I went to L.A. I came close on a few different projects, like the guy, the other guy that didn't like. They went with this dude, and it was between me and him. Mm. This, there was a few projects that happened like that, and because I'll tell you one of the reasons why I've always been so supportive of you is that you are supportive of the people here who are trying to like get the word out about themselves as an artist. And there's just not a lot of that that takes place here. There's not a star system here. It doesn't exist. You gotta go to the East Coast to like find a star system mm -hmm. for entertainers. And so, uh, so consequently, like everything kind of cooled on me after mm -hmm. I came back from LA. It's just like, there's no I spy situation that's coming up. So, you know, it kind of dropped off a bit. I did end up working with, uh, Dave Thomas, who was from SCTV, uh, on, a, on a movie that he put together, and I got to work with Dan Aykroyd. So I've worked with two of the guys, two of the three stars from Trading Places I got to work with. I got to work with, work with Eddie, and I got to work with Dan Aykroyd. Amazing. Um, Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. So, so comedy is a, you know, a big, big thing. I'm, I'm, I thought that I Spy was going to blow up, and it didn't. It didn't end up doing that. But... Like I said before, I, I basically I made Eddie break on camera. I ad libbed, we were ad libbing back and forth, and I said something, and he, and he laughed, and I was like, I could hang with him, I could hang with Eddie Murphy if I can make him laugh like that. Then clearly I, I'm 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 supposed to be here. I Spy didn't didn't do for me what I thought it was gonna do as far as like you know put me on the map and like make everybody know who I am and put me on the next level. It didn't do that. But what it did do was it, it proved to me that I could do it. Mm -hmm. That I could be from nowhere and be and, beside And it's almost that like that's even bigger. Like when, because then when you're walking into the rooms, mm -hmm. um, whether you're auditioning or booking the job or not, because this is like your idol, when this yeah. is your hero that you've looked up to all your life, yeah. and you're like shoulder to shoulder I'm working with right them. Beside and, them. Yeah, and he's like, you're funny, man. Yeah. And he's laughing at your jokes. Yeah. So, so, so like that. Did you feel, so what was that internal shift like for you? And then afterwards when you're going for jobs and booking stuff and working on set, because afterwards yeah. either you're maybe expecting to go there or you're like, okay, because you've gone to the pinnacle. I thought like, it was going <laughs> to keep going. That's yeah. the thing. You're like, it's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. And, you know, it didn't, it didn't work out that way. And. I had to regroup because mm. it's 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 really difficult to go from like something that where you're up on this level, and then you know then the next week you're auditioning for something that's like principal, like it's a smaller role. It's like wh how am I not auditioning for all the leads, supporting lead roles now? Mm. That's what it's supposed to be, and that's not what happened. And so I had literally had to rebuild mm. and try to get back to that level again, and. It's it's a, it's a jungle out there, man. Los Angeles is not easy. A lot of actors go to Los Angeles and it doesn't work out for them. But what I've taken from all of that is, I know I can do it. That and that 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 I don't have that doubt in my head. I I worked with my idol, and I did something that I said I would do when I was like eight years old, which is I said I'm gonna work with him one day. Mm. Like and I did it. And to kind of kind of do that to kind of achieve such a big goal that you set out for yourself it's a it's kind of a it's kind of a crazy feeling because it's a, I don't know if you believe in this but it's also like manifestation mm -hmm. like law of attraction like when you almost like obsessively you're focusing on that and 
Yeah. And sometimes you have to be kind of like what the Gen Z, the kids call it, delulu, like delusional a little bit. <laughs> to, and it came to be. Yeah. And you're working on this, on this show here. It was filmed here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, here and in Budapest. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so amazing. And the fact that you're getting to travel and doing this, and you're his homie. You're working with him. That's what I'm saying. You know, right there. Yeah. And, yeah. and from then onwards... Bib, like look at what you've done like you know it's like i mean mr leacock your career did not just like stop you know what at like but i understand what you're saying that you know you're like you had these aspirations yeah. but like here in Vancouver, the work your body of work the amount of work that you've done you consistently work but i also hear what you're saying that you had to have that internal mindset shift because a lot of being an artist whether you're an actor or painter sculptor or self-employed individual a lot of the game is the inner game. Totally. It's the inner battle of the critic or totally. like um, our own, We're our own uh, worst pride enemies. or yeah. ego or like insecurities or yeah. whatever we think, where we think we should be. But the journey has something else in mind. And I had to let go of me lamenting that I wasn't where I thought I was going. Right? And, and... It just didn't unfold the way I thought it was. But more importantly, in the interim between then and now, I got married and I have three, we have three amazing kids. And becoming a father was always more important to me than anything else. Mm. And um, that's been my biggest win. The Mm. best thing that's ever happened. That's beautiful. Yeah, and it's like, it's like, priorities you know like when you're single and you're an actor and you're chasing this thing well you and your career are the most important things in the world to you that's that's it that's what you that's what you're trying to go after but I knew that as an actor what's going to make me way more interesting is if I have a life that's the deal that's what we're tasked to do we're supposed to be able to replicate life and it's really difficult to do when you only get so far. It's the reason why I never believe Leonardo DiCaprio anytime he plays a dad. Hmm. I don't believe it. He he dates people he's old <laughs> enough to be a parent of. Yeah. How am yeah. I supposed to believe this dude's father? I, I I don't believe it. I think Mark Brandon. Um, Love he, Mark Brandon. Yeah, yeah, he wrote this book many years ago, and he kind of says something similar, like when I was taking classes mm-hmm. and you know and it said something like like have your different hobbies and passions because I was one of those people just like obsessing yep. with that intensity yep. of the yep. you know wanting to move and like all because all you have to yeah yeah and then but worse is when you go out there you're busy living your life and some of that obsession kind of releases and you soften yeah and I'm sure, like, being a husband and father to your children, like, I love seeing the pictures I saw on your Facebook. I sent a little mm-hmm. heart, you know, with your wife and your mm-hmm. kids and these beautiful, it's just a different element that, yeah. you know, that hunger for it. Whereas I'm sure not that you're booking parts, you're just like, you have so much more going to you. And, and I'm sure so many actors must come to you asking you for, like, advice mm-hmm. on, <laughs> you know, whether... I think also like BIPOC actors, like I feel yes. like that's also yeah. because you've been in this industry long enough and you know, it's like today I was like going through your Instagram, I'm sorry, going through your IMDb and I was like, <laughs> okay. And I'm seeing all these pictures with all the peeps. I'm just like, oh wow. Yeah. Man. And yeah. you know what I admire about you, Viv, is like your humility. Yeah. You're always just like, you're just so... You're like, yeah, it's just yeah. a thing I did, you yeah. know, yeah. Like, the, from the moment that I met you to now, like, I was like, okay, he's Mr. Netflix now. He's Mr. Na- Ladder Milk, you know, yeah. here comes the star power. Yeah, man. You, know, you know what, I, this is why, so all, all, three, all three of my kids are, everybody's in the industry, everybody's an actor, and my poor wife. Um, <laughs> she has to deal with four actors now. But, like, 
Uh, Always busy running lines. So busy. Everybody's running lines. Is there a wall painted blue, one painted gray? No, we literally built a studio in the oh, back. Of course you did. To, to, oh, to, I mean, to, it just yeah, makes had sense. To. We it had just to. makes we sense. Had to. For acting. Yeah, we yeah. had to. We had to. How is like, it lit? Everyone's like, Tell me how is it lit? Don't, don't, yeah, don't talk because someone's got an audition. <laughs> that was our house before we had the yeah. studio. Um, so I was saying, I say to the kids all the time, I said, look, I'll tell you what we're doing here as actors. We are people that are able to stand up in front of a camera and a room full of crew and cast and pretend. We're able to drop into a character and play with the imaginary circumstances and make sure that there's stakes behind everything we do. Mm. We're able to do that. Mm. I said, so what are we providing? We're providing a service. The service that we are providing is we are here to help the people that are out there in the world that do all the other jobs that we don't do, who have real stress on their minds because they're operating on a baby in half an hour or the next day, or they're, you know, repairing uh, infrastructure so that people have clean water. They're doing stuff that is saving lives. There are people like that in the world, and we give them a break. That's what we do. We're not here to become famous or to have the last say or word in anything that's going on the planet. That's, <laughs> that's not our gig. Our, what we're tasked to do is take this natural ability to be in front of a camera and it doesn't weird you out to the point that you want to jump off a building because people's worst fear is public speech, but not mm. mine and not mm. yours. But so many people can't do this thing and they don't want to do this thing, which is why actors and artists get so people prop them up they prop us up because they're like i could never do that mm. i could never do that i wouldn't want to do that so yes we have this ability and we should be very proud of the fact that we have this ability but it doesn't make us better than anybody else it just makes us the ones who are helping people have a break that is what we're doing here. yeah that's it so yeah. i can never get a big head because there are people out there doing something that's far more important than what I'm doing. I'm just a part of their process rather than the other way around. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I feel like also during COVID, we learned how much entertainment was important. Oh, yeah. You know, we were binge watching the shows. Yeah. I'm a binger. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I sit there and watch like Netflix the whole season and yeah. one go, let's go continue. That's... Like all these shows that were filmed yeah. here locally. I love watching this stuff. Uh, what was it like working with uh, working on Dirk Gently with like a lot of locals yeah. here, like M Michael Eklund? Michael Eklund, Zach Santiago, Oliver Chow. Um, we, yes, we played the Rowdy Three. There's four of us. <laughs> and uh, we had so it much fun. It looks so fun it's and eccentric. So fun. It's so off the wall. Uh, so my character, Grips, he... He would only, so he was kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy. So his, the, the way his brain worked, he only spoke about what he was seeing in the moment. He didn't talk pa past tense. So he would be like, that's a, that's a burgundy sofa. Like he, he, that's all he was doing. He's just recognizing what he's seeing in front of him. That's it. So it was very interesting playing that character. Um, and when we, had a, we had a ton of fun. That, that show... That show should have blown up on another level. Um, it just, it just, it, it clicked with a lot of fans. It's one of those situations where something becomes a cult, that it gets a little cult following, and that it show it still lives on, and we still have fans that contact us, and and, and yeah, people are blown away by the Rowdy Three. It was a lot of fun. From when you started to now, like you know, back like I Spy days, or even before, versus now in 2024. Of course, as a person of color, as a black Canadian actor, mm -hmm. how do you feel the roles and the jobs you're going for, how that has changed over the years? Yeah. I feel like I really see that for me a lot, like mm -hmm. going from like, mm -hmm. you know, sorry, I'm not trying to yeah. brag or anything, but like, you know, hot girl number two, yeah. bikini babe number three yeah. versus like, okay, she has a name. Yes. And, you know, and then it was like always accents. So yeah. it's like have a few Middle Eastern, yep. Afghani, yep. Indian, you know, different yep. accents in your in your back pocket to like go to. You have to. So for a while, like it was like, 
I'm always that. But now it's like you're doing, okay, I can just speak how I yes. speak. So how has that journey been like for you as a performer? Yeah, honestly, so I started acting when I was 17 and it was on a show called Neon Rider. Neon Rider was um, starring the, the late Winston Record. Uh, and it was a show about um, uh, troubled teens and the group of adults that kind of like open their hearts and their, and their time to make sure that these troubled teens have a place to, to, you know, these urban kids have a place to kind of go away, go to, the, to this ranch and like, you know, hang out and try to, you know, not be so angry. And uh, um, so that was the first gig I ever got. And it was the first audition I ever did. Booked the part, recurring role. Cool. So I'm like learning on the job, basically. And uh, back then, I only, a I acted for about, I was on that show for like a year. And then everything I did after that audition were like, was, was like some of the worst writing for a person of color that I've ever seen. Like every audition I went into, I was getting these, these sides that were horrific. Like, I don't know who wrote this, but no black person in the world would say this. Like, and I'm walking into auditions, and I'm just getting angrier and angrier and angrier with all of the material that I'm going in to, to, to read for. And I actually ended up walking away from acting because I just was like, I don't want to portray another black person in a, in a demeaning light. I'm not going to do it. And that was 90% of the stuff that was being written for black people was like, mugger, uh... Uh, thug, inmate, yeah. thug, like yeah. everything that that you could get an opportunity to do as a young brother in town was like something that you wouldn't want to portray. You just wouldn't want to. But that was the climate at the time. You know, I was 17 in 1991, so we're talking like Rodney King riots and mm. all that stuff. That's what's going on in the background of me getting into this industry. And that's what the world is looking at. And that's what the world is like at the time. And it was just too politically over to one side for me to be a part of it so I literally walked away for like seven years I didn't didn't have anything to do with acting and then came back I came back when I when I realized that I can't change things from the outside but I can change them from the inside mm -hmm. I can you know meet that studio executive who who didn't realize that this was the wrong thing to, to think or say about a black person I can you know, influence that casting director to open their eyes and like, you know, you can you can envision this black person being the dentist. Because when I say that, people, you know, people have never seen a black dentist. Like I'm literally saying something that people, there's 90% of the people I know have never seen. And it's a, it's a real thing. I'm like, have you ever seen a black dentist? No, like they never have. Because you're not gonna see it on TV. You know what I'm saying? Because it's just like, somebody is deciding who represents all of these different things that you that and and if you walk if you go around the world you meet everybody doing everything but television and film has a different idea and it's all about putting people in boxes and so to break out of that box you need the help of the people that are already there they have to know that unless they open their eyes this is not going to change mm -hmm. casting has got to be like hey why don't you see this person for this role mm -hmm. this is a person who, who has the attributes of the, char the characteristics of the, of the character you wrote. They have, the per they have these things inside of them. Why don't you see that person and see what they do? Just a person. Don't have to s nail it down and say, oh, this person needs to be this, this person needs to be that. Now, sometimes, obviously, to tell a particular story, you need people that represent you know, this race or that race or whatever. But so many parts, don't, it's not necessary. And I feel like it's such a way of... Um and people don't realize the power of Hollywood and movies and TV shows. Mm -hmm. uh, for someone who was born in Pakistan, um, when I, I, I moved to Canada at 17, and when you see like a bad guy in a movie, and if the machine, you know, I'm an yep. actor as well, yep. but if the machine is showing you that someone from this part of the world is always the bad guy. That's what you think. If the individual wears this, and this is what they look like, people around the world who are consuming this medium 
they are going to start believing that even if they know that yes this is just a movie it's make believe but when you show it over and over, over again and over through and over. big hollywood mm -hmm. productions mm -hmm. that are winning all these awards and mm -hmm. always the hero is you know yep. mr so and so yep. like who would be a, who is a great actor sure but who is a caucasian guy but then we have this individual who just happens to be of this yep fill, uh, fill faith, in the blanks yeah you know i'm not going <laughs> to yeah. say anything yeah. um as we know there's lots of stuff going on in the world right now but um of this belief and who looks like this mm -hmm. then everyone in the world little by little starts believing that because that becomes a collective mentality yes. and that's how we you know it's like so going from you when you were 20 something to versus now and now yeah. you're writing yeah you're right. You're making your own projects. Yes. You can see my excitement. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, because you, because you, you, you have to, you, you have to, there, there, there's depth. There's net. Look, you're never going to have it that it's always, always going to be lopsided. And, and, and so typically the, the, the landscape looks like the ones running it. That's what, the, that's what everything looks like. Advertising, you know, TV shows, movies, it looks like the people who are behind the scenes, who are in charge of deciding. That's what everything looks like. It looks like them. Yeah. They're the ones in the position, so that they want to see their own stories. That makes sense. That's just what it is. Um, you know, like, I don't think I would, could, could move to another part of the world and that was, you know, has its own movie star system and 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 finds people who are going to be like, hey, let's make a whole all black movie. It's not that's not going to necessarily mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. It's not going to necessarily happen. It's going to, people are going to do. F they're going to work for themselves. Mm -hmm. So and that's why it's so important for us to create our own work. So important. We have to because you you know for someone to write the perfect part for me, I mean it comes along every once in a while where you know again the stars align. You stand. You find yourself standing beside Eddie Murphy, but like. The, I'm supposed to wait, you know, for that to happen again. That was that was a perfect storm of, of, of situations that lined up to, to make that happen. And yes, I had to have the talent and be ready, you know, when it came up. But I'm not going to sit around and wait for that again, mm -hmm. you know. Like, I, yeah, I'd, I would rather try to take what I have now and help shape the way things should be going, you know, or go in the direction that things can go. I just want... I want the best person in the part. You know, if I write something, I want the best person. I don't care what the deal is. Again, like I said earlier, if the story is specific to a particular race, like, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something to play my brother, well, <laughs> they're going to look like me. You know what I'm saying? It's just like that's the way it's going mm -hmm. to work. But if I'm looking for something to play my best friend, he doesn't have to look like me. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the thing. It's just I want the best person uh, and, and an ensemble of amazing people around me. That's it. And I don't, I'm not about like, it has to be like, everybody has to be black. Or, no, no, no. no I I show, showing the culture as it is. Yeah, let's do you that. You know, it's like, which is like where we live, Vancouver, if you go to New York, LA, yeah. Montreal, yeah. all these places. Like, yeah, no, I, I, be, I believe the same. It's like showing the mix. And, but of course, like on our show, like I really make an effort to like highlight. Yeah. You know, and I think it's really important to me because I know what it was like growing up and how what I didn't recognize that that was the thing yeah. that was affecting me. But looking back now, yeah. it was. Um, I want to talk. Uh, are you? Uh, is it okay to talk about the project you just finished working on, like over mm -hmm. the winter time? And I can. Um, you know, I know a little bit about it because I did get to <laughs> like. I don't have a good British accent. My audition was probably terrible, but. Um, it wasn't. It, but 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 it was a um, great story. So I will let you talk about this, about the yes. story that you know you're behind and in front of the camera. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had a, a really cool thing come up in that uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I called up one of the writers that works with Hallmark, and uh, her name is Michelle Ricci, and. Michelle and I have worked together in the past because uh, I did a, a series of movies on for Hallmark called The Haley Dean Mysteries, um, opposite my good friend Kelly Martin. And Michelle came on as a writer from, I think, the third episode onward, or the third movie onward. And 
I, I had never really, um, so I'm, I'm like, again, I talk, I got that whole Eddie Murphy kind of ad lib thing that I love to do. And I had never opened a script ever that I was a part of and have seen what I would say. It's, I, it's always what the character would say and then I change it a lot of times. That's what I, that's what I do with stuff. I just make stuff my own. But this was the first time I opened up a script and the way the character was talking, I was like, that's how, that's how I talk. Like, that's what word I would say right there. And, and she, she nailed my way of speaking. Like, she literally watched interviews and watched the, You're the kidding. movie. She, yeah, she really found my voice and I'm, I couldn't believe I was reading a script that I didn't have to do anything to. I didn't have to change anything. I just couldn't believe it. And... Um, so we, we, we became real close, and, and so I called Michelle, and I said, listen, uh, myself and my uh, co-star from When Calls the Heart, Natasha Burnett, she plays my wife on the show, um, like, we have an idea. For Which is the longest-running Hallmark. The longest-running Hallmark. Hallmark show. Wow, yes. When Calls the Heart, we are... We with are, Loretta Walsh. With Loretta Walsh, my good friend. Yes. Yeah, we're going to get here here as well. Yes, you come in, Loretta. Um, <laughs> Uh, a great ensemble cast, um, uh, yeah, juggernaut of a show. It's been on forever, and myself and two of my three kids joined the cast in season eight. So, yeah, they hired my. It's a family yeah, affair. Yeah, they hired two of my three kids to play my kids on the show, and uh, yeah, so with with this project that I'm, um, so the so the name has changed, or it's changing. So uh, it was called The Hunt for Love. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to be called now, but it's myself and Natasha Burnett. Natasha is an antiques uh, dealer who is trying to find the provenance of, of, a, of a locket that she's been, that her mother, who was also an antiques dealer, was trying to find for like her whole life. And Natasha takes up the search, it leads her to America from the UK, uh, where she ends up bumping into this guy. Uh, I play the sheriff of a small town called named Wilmington. And whilst trying to find this locket, uh, the two fall in love. So, <laughs> the hunt for love. Uh, I love the name Hunt for Love. Yeah, I, I think it's cool too. But um, they want to go with something different. Mm -hmm. um, and, but Natasha and I, had a, we had a great time filming the movie and I'm really proud of this film because the the feedback we're getting from Hallmark they love it uh, they're really really enthusiastic about it it tested very high everybody's very happy um, and they're already very familiar with your work they're already very familiar with my work so um, I, I think we're gonna have more opportunities to, to, to kind of be behind the camera so uh, not only were we the star of, stars of the movie, we were both executive producers as well. So um, I really enjoyed that. Is that process. something you're looking forward to doing more in the future? Producing? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I actually think my brain works a lot more like a producer kind of slash director than a, an actor. I don't necessarily uh, look at scenes from, I don't know, the actor's point of view. I kind of am looking at the whole thing. Like... My biggest thing is I talk about it all the time if I'm coaching anybody or I'm doing an audition or I'm doing Are a you scene. still coaching? I am. I am. Oh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. now that you have my correct number. Yes. <laughs> which, which, and I, which is a story. Which is a crazy story because I don't know how this happened, but Zara has my cousin's old cell number from years ago that he doesn't, he no longer has. But it was still entered into my phone as his number, so when she contacted me, I'm seeing my cousin's name on the phone. It was really weird. And yeah. you can't say no to your cousin. No, no. Yeah, you can't no. say, I'd be like, oh, like, look at these six or whatever pages. <laughs> Hi, okay, yeah, I heard you're Stephen Loba's neighbor. All right, That's okay, my, yep. here, here I come. <laughs> yeah, I got you covered, I got you covered. Um, so, so, yeah, working on the, working on the movie was amazing. Behind, this, behind the scenes, executive producing or producing, and stuff, there's a lot of mm. moving parts. There's mm. a lot of work. Um, I was able to shadow Peter DeLuise uh, for a couple of the episodes on When Calls as a director. 
Um, they know I have ambitions to direct more, and um, they they put together this they put together a little kind of like a program for those those of us on the show who want to direct. Mm. They allow us to shadow uh, the, the the you know the seasoned directors on our show, and so myself and Johanna Newmarch uh, had the opportunity to to shadow. Um, the, the couple of the directors so it's, it's, it's a uh, an amazing experience and as an actor to kind of see all the stuff that happens before you get there mm. is uh, it was eye opening so the days that you're just acting you're like man this is nice <laughs> you're like <laughs> totally changed I my don't have to worry about yeah. that <laughs> yeah because being an executive producer and actor on this movie man man you know everything because there's prep involved in making movies and actors just show up. <laughs> we show up when everything is ready to go. But not producers. Producers are trying to make everything happen. It's it's. Uh, You're trying to make your days. <laughs> trying to make your days. Like the yeah, the biggest thing shadowing Peter and producing this movie has taught me is that time mm. is the you cannot mess with time. You have to keep your time on point mm. you have to if you're a producer or you trying to run stuff you don't get it back you know on on set you lose time that's money you're burning money so uh, i so to all the actors come prepared come ready don't say what's my line where what's happening in this scene don't say that don't do that because you're killing everyone everybody that's there watching you has had this material for weeks before you arrived. And they all know what's going on, so why don't you? So do not be that actor that shows up not having read the whole script. Don't do that. That's great advice. That's like really, really good advice. Um, I want to ask a little bit, uh, other than Eddie Murphy, mm -hmm. is there someone else that you've worked with that you're like, man, this person was on my list of people to work with, and I can't believe I get to be here, work opposite them, yeah. you know, having like a bit of a aha moment, someone pinch me, like, this is happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually got to work with uh, Tom Hardy. Ah. Yeah, on um, a movie, This Means War. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, with Chris, Chris Pine. Reese Witherspoon. And, wow, what a cast! Yeah, and, and you and, and Tom Hardy. Yeah, I was one of the one of the guys lower down the list, but got to work with both Chris and Tom uh, on that movie, and uh, it was really cool. Like Tom Hardy was just about to blow up at this time, so that was it was a trip being around him because we were with him when he got the call that he was going to be Bane for. Batman uh, Rises, mm. The Dark Knight Rises. We were like standing with him and he got the call. And he's like, oh, I got it, I got it. And, and he was like, everybody was pumped for him and hype. And that was a cool experience. And I'm telling you right now, Chris Pine is probably one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet. He is, if you want to look at how someone should be on set with everybody, Chris Pine is mm. the example. He knew everyone's name he looked everyone in the eye please and thank you kind to everyone just spoke to the crew before shooting after shooting thanked everybody i was just like wow this dude this this cat's the real deal he when we finished when we wrapped <laughs> he was like uh everybody uh, myself and Tom and Re and Reese would like to say a few words, <laughs> and Reese with the spirit and Tom Hardy were like, "What? Like what? What's happening right now?" <laughs> and he he was like, "Come on, guys! Come on, guys!" And he thanked everybody and thanked the director, and and they were like, "Nobody does this. You could mm. see it. You could see it. They were just like, "What's happening right now?" But I took note of that man. He and was, that's generous. Yeah, he was he was a good cat, and 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 I had the opportunity to do the same thing on went on the hunt for love uh, I gave a speech to the crew and the cast before we started shooting and it kind of hit me and I was so proud of putting together this film because as far as the timeline this was there was you know because of the strike that happened 
This was some of the crew's first time getting back to work in five, six months. And they're on our movie. And I was just, I was so proud that I made a phone call and made something happen. I made a phone call. I called the writer. She called the producer who walked it into Hallmark. And a year and a half later, it lined up with people being into work, being able to work coming out of a strike. Mm -hmm. And I was just like... I don't know how it all happened and why it did, but that it happened that way, it just mm -hmm. made me more proud. I would have been mm -hmm. proud of the crew had they all come off of something, but to know that people were getting their, you know, getting their, their feet back on the ground and stuff like that, and we, we made that possible, yeah, I, I got, it got pretty emotional that day, and, and even when we wrapped, I was able to say some words, and Natasha said some words as well, and... Uh, yeah, it, it just it just really landed. It was it was a, it was a cool moment. I'm very proud of that. Congratulations! Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. And this is inspiring for me. Before we let you go, Viv, Mr. Leacock, we <laughs> would love to know what inspires you in life. Where do you draw your inspiration from? Hmm. That's good. That's a good question. Um, I've always said that you know, like I said earlier, I always wanted to be a father. Um, my kids are the faces of my drive. Like, before I knew them, I knew they would be, but, you know, in meeting them and, and, and being alongside of them for this ride, this journey, um, yeah, there's nothing I wouldn't do for them and my wife. And just trying to put that together and seeing those examples, uh, you know, it's not, it's not too often you see people that put family first in the in the industry but that's that inspires me i, I love it when people mm. chase their dreams but they 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 pull their family along with them you know it's, that's 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 inspiring to me and a new generation of actors yeah <laughs> um the show is called on location i would love to know is there a particular location you like to go to in the city or surrounding area to Restore, rejuvenate, mm. um, or even just to get your inspiration. You know what? Uh, my wife and I did this yesterday. We so our kids used to belong to a track club, track and field club that uh, we ran up at UBC. And I don't know what it is about being up uh, on the UBC grounds, but I am so drawn to that land the, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is I always we always go in that direction and we love just walking around and we did that yesterday my wife and I we just went and we walked around the campus basically but like we we love being there it's very calming and I also love the Pacific Spirit, Spirit yeah. Park and all that area yeah. yeah all right well thank you so much for taking the time to come out here we finally made it happen after months of you know <laughs> yes. negotiations back and forth with this superstar oh, and no oh, i'm kidding i'm kidding we're so glad i'm just so excited to see everything you've accomplished uh great to have you here and looking forward to working together yes yeah. and then we'll be doing more of these but i'm yes. honestly you really inspire me and i'm so oh. glad we had this today and Thank you. So proud of you. Thank so you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, make sure to watch his new show, Louder Milk. And of course, continue watching When Calls the Heart. Mm -hmm. And look out for the new movie, which is going to be renamed. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, it will be coming out soon. <laughs> and uh, until next time, I'm your host, Zara Durrani. And this was Wibbly Cock. Thank you for joining. The show is produced with the support of Tell a Story Hive.